What's that? Oh, what's that? Hello and welcome again to Murphy & Company. I'm Michelle Murphy and this is my interview show with fascinating people. And today I have a most interesting erudite gentleman, my cardiologist, who has been kind enough to give us his time yet another week. He was here last week with us. Welcome, Dr. Michael Wolk. It's great to be back. Thank you for coming all the way from Wild Cornell, the wilds of New York City, out to see us here in the hinterlands. I'm happy to be here. It's a wonderful environment. It's very relaxing and good for the heart. He's my cardiologist. You were honored, though, at the Heart Association annual dinner out here recently. Right. But the American College of Cardiology is the 40,000 cardiologists around the world, and we advocate for better quality of care and good patient care. And, but the American Heart, I was fortunate to be honored here three years yes. ago with Christy Brinkley, of all people. Yes. And it was a lovely that opportunity. That was a fun yeah. evening. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that well. So 40,000 cardiologists are members of the College of... Cardiology. Uh, and you were the past president of that organization, correct? Correct and all the while balancing your own practice. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the Heart Fund? Do you remember that? The Heart Fund? I was Miss Heart Fund. How many years ago should I <laughs> Oh, <ask? laughs> I was, let's see, that was in the 60s. Oh. And, I and my dad crowned me at the uh, Sky Club here, and that was called the Heart Fund. And I believe that became the organization that honored you the American Heart Association, which is different then. So we have all of these things straight. Mm -hmm. Hard to keep it all straight, but anyway, we are here to talk about something very, very important, which is the Affordable Care Act, which is called the ACA. So, whew, what a subject this is. And tell us, first of all, why do we even need the ACA? Well, I don't know if everybody agrees that they need the ACA, but I think the ACA uh, was an important piece of legislation. It could have been done better, but it did accomplish, attempts to accomplish three major uh, activities. One is it improves access to care. We have terrible access to care for Americans. When you have 50 to 55 million Americans who are uninsured, who have no health insurance, that's a tragedy, and that is quite different, as you can imagine, than other countries where there is universal insurance and all individuals have insurance. So we had an access issue, and don't forget, these are the folks who got sick and yet didn't go to the hospital until it was too late or too expensive or too challenging. Um, so access was one of the reasons for the Affordable Care Act. When you say access, you access. mean... The opportunity to have a physician to get just care. the word access, right. having the ability to get a hold of medical help. Get medical help when you need it. Yes. Not because it's dollar driven. Not because you know you have an insurance policy that helps support the opportunity mm -hmm. to see a physician. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just jumping ahead for a minute, we think of all the emergency rooms that are clogged with people with colds or the flu, using it incorrectly. Is that part of this big picture that's a problem? Well, it, it's part of the reason why we need to solve the problem. Yes. Because emergency rooms are really expensive. Yes. Um, and folks shouldn't go there for routine care. Mm -hmm. And if they had access to care and their own physician to go to mm -hmm. and they can afford that physician, mm -hmm. then we would not see emergency rooms clogged and overwhelmed as they currently are. So the ACA did access the care. The mm -hmm. second of the three things it did is the quality of care. So Michelle, because mm -hmm. 55 Mar million Americans did not have access to care, the quality of care overall for Americans was poor. And that was pointed out in the Commonwealth survey that looks at 11 parameters. And in each of the parameters, the United States ranked near bottom. So of all developed countries, we did not do a good job 
in quality of care, access to care, no matter what measure you measured, mm -hmm. we set low, and that needs to be improved. In addition to access of care and quality of care, mm -hmm. and by the way, that doesn't mean that if you have a ruptured aorta, you won't get the very best care in the world at some hospitals. That was going to be my next centers. question. Yeah. So but the point is yes. that millions and millions, 50 millions, uh -huh. don't have a doctor to go to to, to get mm -hmm. care. Because they don't have insurance and doctors they aren't They can't gonna... afford insurance uh -uh. or they don't have the opportunity to purchase insurance. Right. So access is an issue, quality an issue, and the last and major problem is cost. If you look at the United States expenditures on health care, mm -hmm. it's close to 18% of the GDP, the gross domestic product. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to put more and more money into health care, mm -hmm. it takes away money for other very important issues. And those issues, for example, are infrastructure, building our bridges, education, mm -hmm. support, food stamps, whatever. Uh, yeah. But we're taking more money into health care and pulling it out of many areas that desperately need support and help. And our health care costs are double or more than developed nations, whether that developed nation is Canada or France or Britain or Germany or Austria. Our health care costs per individual are individuals is quite high. $9,000 per individual is way too much, and we're not mm -hmm. getting the value for that. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of money per individual, but when we measure the quality of care, it's not as good as it should be. So we need to do better. And the ACA is the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. is perhaps one way to help. Mm -hmm. Whoa, this is so mind boggling. I don't know where to start with asking you questions, but one very simple question that comes to my mind is if you have to go to the emergency room, the first thing they ask you for is what is your insurance and you have to register even if you're bleeding. So why are they filled with people who don't have insurance then? Is it that they must take everybody no matter what? We have good laws in the United States mm -hmm. that make ensure that every hospital that's publicly supported and virtually mm -hmm. every hospital gets some support mm -hmm. for education or infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, there are laws that dictate that you must see every patient who comes to see you, mm -hmm. for example, in the emergency department. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and that's reasonable because in the right. past, some of those patients got shunted to other hospitals and delayed, and care was delayed, which was unfortunate could be for fatal. the outcomes yes. of care. It could be fatal, as you say. But we need to get people to get preventive care, to see yeah. their primary care doctor right. before they develop instances where they need to go to emergency rooms yeah. as examples. Exactly. And can you tell us a little bit about the exchange in New York State? Well, the exchange in the country in New York State mm -hmm. are interesting because mm -hmm. how are we getting people insured mm -hmm. is probably a question that you want to ask. Mm -hmm. um, and nationwide, there are several different ways under the ACA. We're getting people insured up to 138% of the federal poverty level because they go into Medicaid. And these are people who honestly make less than fifteen or $18,000 as individuals or even as families. Yeah. So if you're up to 138% of the federal poverty level, then Medicaid is available. But as you understand, Medicaid is available only in those states and mainly Democratic states who supported the Medicaid expansion. And other states, mainly Republican states, did not support it. And so there hasn't been a lot of sign up in some states. But New York State's a good example because over 500,000 individuals who previously, many of whom did not have insurance, not all, but many of whom did not have insurance, signed up for Medicaid. Therefore, they have access. It may not be perfect, mm -hmm. but they have access to care, they have health insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's helpful. So the ACA increased access to care through Medicaid as one example. Mm -hmm. The second way it increased access was through the exchange. Those people, Michelle, who made 138 to 400 percent of, of federal poverty level, they could have made up to $90,000 as a family. Mm -hmm. 
but even $90,000 when you have to pay for school and education and food and rent, there's not money left over for health care. So right. these people were frequently uninsured, mm -hmm. or if they were not uninsured, they were underinsured. They just didn't have the means to get right. the health care right. they deserved to get. Yes. So with the exchange, people mm -hmm. could sign up for the exchange. Mm -hmm. And as we remember, it was a very bumpy ride for the first couple of months, mm -hmm. but a very successful sign up in the last six weeks or so of that exchange sign up. And so people sign up for the exchange, and they can sign up at different levels of insurance. And there's concerns about it because there's high deductibles and high co-pays. But nonetheless, they had an insurance product that permitted them to get care from hospitals and doctors that they previously didn't have. Mm -hmm. And depending on their income level, that is whether they were closer to 138 or closer to 400% of the federal poverty level, they got tax relief for the premiums and or they got tax relief or subsidies for the co-pays and the deductibles. So in instance, people who were making 40 or 50,000 spent all that money on home and education uh, and food, now can go to a doctor and go to a hospital and have an insurance card that permitted them to get care. So that was a big step forward in diminishing the number of patients who were uninsured. In New York State, your question was 500,000 were Medicaid, 400,000 were in the exchange. So here we have 900,000 more patients in New York State having insurance. Now again, I have to preface this by saying yes. some had insurance pre-existing. But again, a wonderful opportunity to get more people insured to get health care and to get to, the, to a physician or a hospital. Well, there's so many different types of insurance, as I don't have to tell you. But you can tell us a little bit perhaps about the differences, like there's um, Medicare, Medicare Advantage, Medicare fee-for-service, and so forth and so on. And it gets so confusing. It is confusing. It's confusing yes. to the person trying to purchase insurance. Mm -hmm. And physicians, honestly, are confused. Mm -hmm. And the terminology is confusing because mm -hmm. any insurer could have 40 or 80 products that all sound the same, the diamond, the silver, the gold, the oh, platinum. Yes. Right. So it's him. But basically, remember this. Yes. Under 65... The United States is quite different than the rest of the world. We have employer-based insurance. That began in the World War II where employers could not give wage increases. They were prohibited from doing that by government. Mm -hmm. And the only way they can attract workers, or one way they can attract workers, was to give them health insurance. Mm -hmm. So the United States is, States is unique, for better or for worse, mm -hmm. to have employer-based insurance for under 65. For those who are poor and can't afford it, Medicaid then plays a role. For over 65, we have Medicare. But we have two kinds of Medicare, Michelle. We have the fee-for-service Medicare that the government runs, mm -hmm. where we have money taken out of our Medicare monthly checks that go to the government, and where you can go to any physician of taken your choice. Taken out of the Social Security check? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can go to any physician of your choice mm -hmm. or any hospital of choice. Mm -hmm. But what's becoming increasing popular is something called Medicare Advantage, where the government pays the private insurers, the United, the Ends, the Signers, the Empires, uh, the WellPoints, to provide Medicare Advantage. And mm -hmm. people like that because there's no premium deductible. Everything is, quote, free. They get dental insurance sometimes, gym insurance. They get opportunity to go to a gym. So maybe over... 30% of Americans now have signed up for Medicare Advantage. The I didn't know that dentistry and gym was involved with that. That's Not amazing. all Medicare Advantage plans, but in a good number. Oh, And that's why it's attracting more and more people away from the government fee-for-service plans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the restrictions is, is you pay a price for everything in this world, oh, yes. and the restriction there is they are, they are HMO products, which yes. simply means that they're managed, you have to have a primary care doc, whereas in regular Medicare, you're free to choose. And frequently, mm -hmm. you need permission to do certain tests, mm -hmm. whether it be cardiovascular test or a CAT scan or whatever. Mm -hmm. So Medicaid, the exchange, Medicare Advantage, 
Medicare itself or mm -hmm. dominant payers, but mm -hmm. certainly under 65, employer-based still is the major way we do things in this country. A couple of things. Um, Billy Crystal has a very funny book out about um, 50 Sundays or something like that. And he talks about his incredible relationship now with all of his different dentists. And as we all know, the older you get and you head toward Medicare, your teeth get older and become problems. Mm -hmm. I recently, for instance, had a head of an implant. Mm -hmm. $7,000 yes. yes. for an implant. Yeah. And um, most people don't have dental insurance, and it's very, and even my dentist said, mm -hmm. nobody has it. I thought, well, I should have become a dentist. Mm -hmm. But it's amazing to me that the older you get, certain things happen, mm -hmm. and there's no coverage. And Medicare doesn't cover Except, uh, dental work. Medicare yeah. Advantage covers some dollars, but not a, yeah. enough dollars to pay for the and all uh, had, the baby you know. boomers will yeah. all go toothless. Yeah, the, I think there's a lot of dental coverage in employer-based plans, but yeah. you know it's limited. And, it's and limited. if you have a two thousand dollar or a fifteen hundred dollar cap, it'll pay for a couple of fillings, but it won't pay for reconstruction. Yeah, and then I'm understanding that there are certain penalties given by employers if um, their employees do not say take the stairs or go to the gym. Are you, this was just on NPR yesterday. I found that fascinating. Well, I think employers are trying to do wellness programs. I think yeah. that's what you're alluding yeah. to. Uh -huh. And some wellness programs have been mm -hmm. welcomed and some have not been welcomed. Yeah. Um, first of all, wellness programs have not clearly demonstrated benefit yet. There's really? hope that will demonstrate benefit, but I think mm -hmm. we need to figure more that out more and get more longitudinal studies on that. Mm -hmm. But right now there are some benefits. For example, some payers will reduce your deductible if you join a gym or reduce yes. your deductible if you permit the employer to do a cholesterol blood test. That's it too. Yes. Or permit the employer, for example, to do a five question survey about your health so that, mm -hmm. that they can encourage you to get appropriate care. So a lot of the wellness programs are well-meaning, but right. some, but, invasive but it's to being your pushed privacy. back. Yeah. It's invasive to your privacy. It does, and it's being pushed back from that, yes. but, but it does have some advantages, yes. and I think it'll, it'll move forward, but I think mm -hmm. it'll be, there'll be pushbacks and there'll be changes in it. Mm -hmm. I think eventually there is room for wellness programs, and we need to yes. encourage employees, employees who are obese. They should have the ability to either go to a physician free of charge by the mm -hmm. employer, right? or maybe pay more of a penalty. And maybe the mm -hmm. same should be of a smoker. If mm -hmm. you smoke, why should the employer charge the smoker mm -hmm. and you, a non-smoker, the same co-pays or deductibles? So that's evolving that's at this particular time. That's very interesting. It could cause bickering. <laughs> Well, the Among goal employees. is to make Americans healthier. That's yes, the goal. Yes, to make them healthier yeah. in every and way. And lower premiums for the employers yes. who currently can't afford to pay for health insurance. Yeah. It's gotten too expensive. It's too much. Now, tell us what is a narrow network? So I think we're all moving to mm -hmm. new approaches to figure mm -hmm. out how to provide health care mm -hmm. and actually how to pay for it, how yes. to pay physicians. Uh, and there's a number of ways to do it. Mm -hmm. Very popular now, everybody's read about narrow networks mm -hmm. um, where doctors are restricted, where a plan, and recently, for example, United did this for their Medicare Advantage plan. Mm -hmm. They narrowed the network by 30%. That is, they removed 30% of the physicians within that network mm -hmm. because they thought they can choose physicians who were either better quality physicians mm -hmm or provided lower costs for those patients. Mm -hmm. uh, that's unclear, but nonetheless, what, what payers are doing is they're providing insurance to certain employers of networks that are narrower, in turn for that employer provi providing a lower premium. So if I had 300 people employed mm -hmm. by myself, mm -hmm. I might get a 10% discount by having my employees go to a network where there were fewer doctors, fewer hospitals, and fewer choices. And hopefully those choices would be better. 
But there's risk in that, and I think there's also there's pushback in that, and that's one example uh, of change in how we do healthcare delivery. There are many others. <laughs> uh, I have a question, and, and then we're gonna move on, but a personal question. If you, let's say, um, we're just having dinner with a bunch of other physicians, and you're all ta and you're all turning sixty-five, and you're talking about what you're going to do, um, what you're going to pick. What what do people in the know like you advise one another? What 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 do you physicians say to one another, or to your family members who are not physicians? What do as you advise? As far as insurance, Michelle. Yes, yes. Well, as they're coming into age. Medicare. Okay, so you're coming age. into Medicare at yeah. sixty-five, and you have our two, baby boomers. You have two main choices. Mm -hmm. You have Medicare and Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage clearly is somewhat less expensive to the individual, but again, a lot of individuals mm -hmm. like their freedom and like their to have full choice of doctors. Go to as many cardiologists as you want, go to any hospital they want, uh -huh. and therefore they choose fee-for-service Medicare. But Medicare Advantage has, some adv has advantages because they're managed better and they yes. may provide lower cost care. So let's say the working as you do at one of the top hospitals in the world, um, and you're perhaps used to a clientele that's privileged and has been used to getting the best doctors possible, and suddenly they're 65, and life is different then. Mm -hmm. And what, what are they choosing to do with, it, with this? Well, at our institution, uh -huh. our physicians are in Medicare who are full-time and employed. Um, so we don't permit our physicians at Weill Quinnell mm -hmm. to back out of Medicare. You've been taking care mm -hmm. of a patient for 40 years, mm -hmm. suddenly they're 65. Mm. It's really not quite ethical to drop that patient because mm -hmm. suddenly the reimbursement drops down by 60 or 70 or 80 percent, which is what happens. If you see only Medicare mm -hmm. patients, mm -hmm. the revenue stream for that practice may not be su sufficient to pay the expenses of the practice, to the pay rent the, in the New rent, York, to pay the salaries that are appropriate for these hard work for a hardworking staff. Yeah, uh, but nonetheless, it's a problem. Though it, it's a problem, but I think basically we're committed mm -hmm. as a academic mm -hmm. center, and mm -hmm. so are ninety percent of the physicians in the country are still mm -hmm. in Medicare, but there are individuals who have backed out, mm -hmm. or there are other individuals who have gone to different formats of requiring a dollar amount per year to treat patients. But mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, the right way is to make sure that Medicare pays a sufficient level of reimbursement for the services mm -hmm. provided. And they're trying different techniques now to do it. They're, pro they're mm -hmm. looking at accountable care organizations where you take care of a population of patients and you get a set fee for that population. And mm -hmm. if you do a good job, then there may be money to share within the physician community or the hospital community. So accountable care organizations are becoming popular and are accountable worth care. accountable care organizations yeah. uh -huh. where you take responsibility for a population of patients, whether it be Medicare patients, mm -hmm. even commercial patients. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so among, among physicians, if you're at a holiday party with major physicians and one says, I'm not going to, I can't change my lifestyle. I cannot accept mm -hmm. Medicare. I'm not taking them anymore, only as it was before. So is that doctor considered unethical for making that choice, or is it understood? Because I know certain departments, even at Weill mm -hmm. Cornell, the whole department will not take Medicare. Um, well, I, I think at Weill Cornell we do take Medicare, but we have sister institutions, mm -hmm. orthopedics, for example, where many people are out. Yeah. I wouldn't call it unethical behavior. Mm -hmm. I would call it what the, beha the choice has to be the physician's choice. Yes. Clearly, Medicare pays a dollar amount that really is quite low. Mm -hmm. And if you look over the last 10 years, there's been no increase in Medicare despite an increase 
in the cost of living going forward. Yes. And every year, physicians have to face this cliff where it goes down 21% unless Congress comes and backs it up. So 10 straight years, we wait to mm -hmm. December 31st, and Congress prevents a 21% fall. It's good to um, go into obstetrics. Yeah. All of your patients never turn 65. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, but gynecology, they are, and some of those gynecologists are out. So mm. access to care over mm -hmm. 65 is a little bit more of a challenge. Yeah. But I think overall in the United States, most We're physicians, gonna fine. you're going to be fine, but you're yeah. gonna have to, you may not have the physician of, quote, your choice, but yeah. there are many good physicians. And we don't want to lose our young people who are so thrilled to become doctors like yourself, right. who are going to be discouraged to but go Michelle, into your field. But the better answer is to change the payment system and yes. how we deliver health care. Yes. If physicians got paid as an accountable care organization, mm -hmm. or they got paid as a bundle, that is you get a, a certain set amount of money, bundle of money for somebody coming in for bypass surgery or mm -hmm. angioplasty, and you share that money, yes. and you got incentivized for quality of care, and skill of that care and outcomes of that care. Mm -hmm. So I think moving to different payment mechanisms would be the right way to do That's it. That's the way. And you, you've helped me so much to understand from the physician's viewpoint, with which we as the patients don't always get in your shoes. So today's discussion has taught us all so much, but also helped us to understand how a physician that's given his whole life to this is faced with these challenges as well going forward. Well, we'll work. I think we're all committed to mm -hmm. doing a better job. I yeah. think physicians in this country want to provide better value. Yes. The better value simply is better quality of care Yes. at cost that is either lower or we're not going up 10% a year. And in yes. the last two or three years, it's gone up 3 to 4% a year. So we're committed to better value. Mm -hmm. And we can do that by, there's a number of programs to do that. And uh, uh, Choosing Wisely is an uh, American Board of Internal Medicine program that for every specialty, there's five recommendations. For example, don't do a CAT scan in somebody who comes to you with a headache, unless there's a real <laughs> right. story about that uh -huh. headache. Or yeah. for back pain, don't do mm -hmm. an MRI the first visit unless mm -hmm. they really need it. Mm -hmm. So we, we're doing unnecessary tests historically, but I think we're getting better at doing more appropriate testing and choosing tests more wisely than we did before. And that's what we're working on to provide better value, better quality, lower cost. It's wonderful. And of course, the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation out here, if you just want to close by speaking a little bit about that, which you're so involved with. So I've been on the board for yes. about 15 years, and it's a great Thank group goodness. of people because yeah. to go from Montauk to Southampton yeah. Hospital takes two and a half hours some days in the summertime at 3 yeah. o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So for those people who preceded me on that mm -hmm. board, to set up a facility on Pantigo Road mm. of physicians is wonderful. So excellent ones. Great I've been physicians, there. great specialties yes. to be able to go there. And yes. the more recent approach of building an urgent care center, much less expensive than an emergency department, but an urgent care center right next to or close to our foundation has been wonderful because the growth has gone from 2,000 patients to this year 7,000 patients who otherwise would have gone to Southampton Hospital or who knows to where. 7,000, my goodness. They have fish hooks. In their hand. I mean, why do they right. have to go there? Yeah. They need three three stitches. Mm -hmm. Go to East Hampton Healthcare Foundation. And if they need an they ambulance, have, they get it yeah, there. They may right have away. lime and a tick. Yeah. We can take it out. Yeah. And if they need help, of mm -hmm. course, we'll call and get the ambulance to take them to Southampton. Right. And if in the future, clearly, we are supporting innovative, creative. Mm -hmm. That is the East Hampton Healthcare Foundation ways to provide better health care for the community. Yeah. And so we will be transferring. Uh, this facility, the Surgeon Care Center, to Southampton Hospital. And so Fantastic. we'll go on to the next yeah. opportunity. And you must come back again because we didn't get to speak about mental health. So we're leaving that to the, till the very end, but we don't have time. We've run out of time. So we'll all have to be a bit 
bit off center until we get back and you explain it all to us. And we will do that. Thank you How's for the that? opportunity to okay. be here today, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Carry on the great work. It's just great having you. Thanks for being here, everybody. Come back and we will hear what Dr. Wolk has to say about mental health and what's going on out here on the East End to improve mm -hmm. that as well as everything else. Yeah.